This is Close Reads, a philosophy podcast with Mark and Wes. I'm Wes Alwyn. And I'm Mark Lintzenmeyer. Today we're talking about Plato's Republic, specifically the part where he talks about forms at the end of book six, the supposed divided line analogy. So it's 507 B, or we will send you a link. Somebody had posted the complete works, so the translation here is by GMA Groob, revised by CDC Reeve, PDF page 1159. Stardust. 507B. Or did you say that already? Yep. All right. So this is... Socrates and Glaucon. I guess I'm Socrates right now and you're Glaucon. Is that sure. right? Yep. We say that there are many beautiful things and many good things and so on for each kind. And in this way, we distinguish them in words. We do. And beauty itself and good itself and all the things that we thereby set down as many reversing ourselves, we set down according to a single form of each believing there is but one, and call it the being of each. That's true. All right, you want to stop here and <laughs> I mean, is it, <laughs> figure is it out what true? he's talking about? Uh, so, many good things, many, you know, very typical Socrates things. We distinguish them in words. Yeah, so far in the Republic, the, the idea of the forms has only come up insofar as you know the the common people just get fixated on beautiful things but the elevated folks the people that should be in charge of the city distinguish that from the beautiful so here's what he's explaining our translator has not capitalized form as if this is not a technical term the beauty itself and good itself and all the things we thereby set down as many Reversing ourselves, we set down according to a single form of each, believing that there is but one, calling it the being of each. So these qualities that we run into in our everyday lives, at least some of them, at least the ones that refer to good things, the beauty and goodness, uh, justice, other stuff like that, they have a being. And there's just a single thing that picks out, you know, that makes all just actions just, that makes all uh, beautiful things beautiful, etc. So the, there's an interesting way he's putting it here, which is that we distinguish things in words. So when we treat the beautiful as many or the good as many, it doesn't sound like he's sympathetic to an ontology in which there are actually many things and the good and the beautiful are somehow in them or somehow they partake of them. Although, of course... That does seem to be the overall picture, that there is some sort of partaking, although he does subject it to an ex extensive critique in the Parmenides. But in any case, the distinction, it seems as if he's saying the distinction is only in words, or perhaps we might say, if we were to update that epistemology, it happens only in the realm of appearance. And I guess he is going to, you know, he is making that distinction in the Republic between the world of appearance and the, the real world. So when we designate a particular, or in other words, I guess what I'm trying to say is it sounds as if when we experience a particular as a beautiful thing, um, that experience of it as divided, the experience of it in, this, in its particularity is in a way an illusion is what it sounds like i'm i'm thinking out loud so i'm not committed to that idea but you get what i'm saying with this I, I distinction that, between the words and the being but yeah well i think that that fits with what i understand about plato in terms of the ontology i'm not sure about the words the way i actually read this sentence was it says we say there are many beautiful things and many good things and so on for each kind and in this way we distinguish them in words so what if the words is not distinguishing the individuals but distinguishing the kinds and so on for each kind. 
I'm not I'm not committed to that either. I, I think your your reading might be just fine, but I'm wondering on which side are are words on the side of the illusory, the the plurality, or are mm -hmm. words actually clues that yeah you know why do we call all these things justice? Why do we all call all these things beautiful? Because they have an essence. The word actually is the chief clue that we have, or rather our use of the word, if it's accurate, if it's an accurate use, the concepts that the words are picking out, those are about dividing being, and that is how we do philosophy. It's not, at least not necessarily part of the elite. Well, we know he's unsympathetic to trying to define kinds by way of giving a list of their examples. Sure. Is that the Theotetus that starts that way, or the Mino, or... But in any case, I think it might you be ask for a definition. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You give me what a is such banquet. and such? What I is asked, virtue? I ask for a, give the me, menu and you give me a whole banquet or whatever. Right. You give me a list of things, but I wanted the thing itself. So that's the mm -hmm. that's the idea. But all right. Shall we shall we keep going? Sure. And we say that the many beautiful things and the rest are visible, but not intelligible. While the forms are intelligible, but not visible. That's completely true. With what part of ourselves do we see visible things? With our sight. And so audible things are heard by hearing, and with our other senses we perceive all the other perceptible things. That's right. Have you considered how lavish the maker of our senses was in making the power to see and be seen? I can't say I have. Well, consider it this way. Do hearing and sound need another kind of thing? in order for the former to hear and the latter to be heard? A third thing in whose absence the one won't hear or the other be heard? No, need nothing else. All right, let's just stop here. Yeah. I'm, con I'm getting confused again. <laughs> um, okay, Many are, many are visible. The things that we distinguish in words are, well, if I'm right on that reading, are visible but not intelligible. So our relationship to particulars, it's interesting to say that that our relationship to each particular thing is not a matter, matter of intelligibility, but our relationship to the, to the forms, to the metaphysical substrate is a matter of intelligibility. And this, of course, enters into the philosophical tradition as intellectual intuition, the thing that Kant ends up rejecting, right? But others embrace, like Malebranche and, and Descartes. Um, and then we move on to our mode of access to the particulars through the senses. Okay, so it's sensibility, not intelligibility. So hearing, seeing, and then the maker of the sentence is the power to see and be seen. This power to be seen is really important. We typically think of this in terms of just the power of seeing, right? Mm -hmm. So the seeability, and for Aristotle, this becomes the, the knowability of things is a really interesting thing. How is it that they are of a nature to be knowable well they must be formal to be knowable there must be some element of formality in them that can't just be merely material there must be something in them that is capable of impressing itself formally on our subjectivity and the question here is a an ambiguous one do hearing and sound need another kind of thing for that connection to take place and obviously okay, so it's supposed for, to be no, but it seems what like... What is well, the former and the latter? Uh, the, the thing, the, the sense of hearing and sound is the latter. Sound is the thing heard. So do, do they need a third thing? Which you might say, well, actually you do need, for instance, intelligibility. You need the mind because otherwise sound would not actually be heard. It might make an impression but you wouldn't be able to identify what it is. You wouldn't, you know, so the hearing you could say is something larger that involves understanding. The hearing is identifying, but he, he wants to, no, no, we're just talking about the sense, the hearing and the sound. Do we need a third thing? Well, do we need the air? 
no, no, no. But but the sound actually includes not just the thing you hear. It's not like if you hear a bird, the sound is the bird. The sound is the tweeting of the bird. And and in the definition of sound is something that is mm -hmm. in a medium so that your ears are optimized. The, the mm -hmm. In fact, you could even say the hearing is more than the ears. The, the hearing might be some sort of system. So you got whatever the system of mm -hmm. hearing is and the system of the sound. Yeah. So by definition, if you if you if you draw those circles large enough, they don't need a third thing. But if you draw them very narrowly, well, yeah, they might need a medium. They might need uh, intelligibility. They might need any any number of things. Yeah, I'm reminded of explaining sleeping potions in terms of their dormitive power as opposed to explaining it through scientific mechanistic causation. But let me just think about that for a second. I mean, if I were Glaucon, I'd be awfully confused by this statement. Need a third thing? What, what are you talking about? What is he on to here? Have you have you just read ahead so you have a sense of what the, what he's on to with this third thing here? Or you're well, just speaking I, out loud? Um, I have I have read ahead, but not okay. this morning. Uh, <laughs> so, so Mark let's, Mark cheated. Let's let's keep going and see. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, you be Socrates. Okay. And if there are any other and and if there are any others that need such a thing, there can't be many of them. Can you think of one? I can't. I'm trying to think what the others. So th there are hearing, there's seeing, s smelling. What, yeah. are, what are the others that need such a thing? That's the, such the an absolute five question. senses, right? Or, I mean, is that all he's talking about, though? Or is he? Don't know. All right. Any other senses, but just any others. That's not so great. Yeah. Okay. I can't think of one. Um, can you think of one? I can't. All right. You don't realize that sight and the visible have such a need? How so? Okay, so he's just setting up to give to give the opposite account. He's just setting setting Glaucon up to re refute this now and give his own theory. All right. Sight may be present in the eyes, and the one who has it may try to use it, and colors may be present in things. But unless a third kind of th thing is present... I almost said nothing, third kind of nothing. But unless a third kind of thing is present, which is naturally adapted for this very purpose, you know that sight will see nothing and the colors will remain unseen. What kind of thing do you mean? I mean what you call light. Ah, you're right. Wow, you're just so easily <laughs> pushed around Glaucon. <laughs> Well, now, I'm gonna, now let me go back and say the opposite again. All right, now. Uh, which which then, you need light for sound. <laughs> I mean, for, for sight. But do yeah. you need anything comparable for sound? Like when I was thinking about a medium, I was thinking sound. But I, I guess light, you know. Well, you're on the right track, obviously. I guess we need air uh, for sound, right? Otherwise, yeah, you wouldn't. I think yes. you'd, you'd, there'd be an analogy to, well, I don't know what would, would be with touch exactly. But um. Then isn't an isn't then it it <laughs> then it isn't an insignificant kind of link that connects the sense of sight and the power to be seen. It is a more valuable link than any other linked things have got, if indeed light is something valuable. And of course, it's very valuable. All right, why why are we talking about the value the value now of light? I mean, this, this whole thing is going to be a metaphor. I, I know that much. Okay, but, it connects the sense of sight and the power of being seen. More valuable. Okay, I mean, obviously he's setting something up, but but now we're talking about the value, all right? I mean, they're all, it seems like they're all valuable. They're all necessary parts of the system. If you didn't have ears, then you can't hear. If you don't have eyes, you can't see, even if there is light all around. So you need the thing to be seen. You need the light and you need the sense organ. Well, I'm glad you think this is obvious, Glaucon, because <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. No, right. But it's an odd way to put it in terms of value is, uh, it seems a bit odd. Maybe it's not odd in context, um, in the, you know, the context of ancient Greece, but it, it's, we, we say it's necessary and we say it's a mechanism, the mechanism involved, but today we wouldn't say 
we wouldn't describe the we wouldn't explain in explaining seeing we wouldn't talk about oh this this there's this very valuable thing and I, it's I, in virtue maybe, of its valuable its, its value that that anyway well maybe the background we can, we'll find out that... he's setting he must be setting up something interesting with that and we'll find out but isn't that if if you're saying that these senses exist for our good you know so it is valuable for the mechanism to work it is not a a hypothetical imperative if you want to see i guess this is what how, you know if you want to build this machine no these are these are goods and so something that makes the good work would be very valuable it's a link that's valuable and more than any other link apparently and we're going to find out the why why that's the case too do which of the gods over? i hear i'll be socrates now which of the gods in heaven would you name as the cause and controller of this the one whose light causes our sight to see in the best way and the visible things to be seen the same one you and others would name obviously the answer to your question is the sun and is in sight by nature related to that god in this way which way well sight isn't the sun neither sight itself nor that in which it comes to be, namely the eye. No, it certainly isn't. But I think it is the most sun-like of the senses. Very much so. And it follows from, and it receives from the sun the power it has, just like an influx from an overflowing treasury. Certainly. The sun is not sight, but isn't it the cause of sight itself and seen by it? That's right. All right. So are are we before we reveal yeah. the analogy, let's <laughs> just make is, sure we're we're good the here. The sun is the cause of sight. Okay. That's obviously an ambiguous there's an ambiguity in that. It's the cause of sight in that we need it to see things unless we've invented fire. <laughs> I mean, there's you know, we could use fire to see things. But in any in any case, originally it's the cause of seeing in particular cases of seeing but not obviously the cause of the capacity to see not cause of the eyes or the having the, the structure of the eyes or how all that works so what is he you know so this is uh, this is one of socrates typical absurdities that he gets people to agree to and then the, the question is always why he's getting people to agree to it sight isn't the sun but it receives the power it has from the sun. So it, it it's a very interesting, you know, it brings up some interesting questions about, so we think of the power of seeing in terms of the structure of the eye, like I said, and, and all of that stuff. I, I suppose, is there some account of sight in which the power of the capacity of something to do do something is outsourced entirely to something else do you understand what i'm asking uh no do you have an example well we think of the power as something innate to the organ to the mm -hmm. to the internal capacity that we have so we explain the power of the eye to see in terms of it's having um, I don't know an iris. <laughs> what is the structure of the sure. no, no, and I, cones I think, and all think... that stuff? So, but but to receive from the sun the power it has, I'm it worth, I'm thinking of in terms of is this some idea of a, a capacity in an organ that we would normally describe as innate as being outsourced to some other entity of course that would line up with the forms right the kind of outsourcing of the being of a thing which we might normally think of as innate to it to something in this other external world i mean there are a number of so if you're uh deaf and you have a cochlear implant so actually you're receiving something like hearing but it's using completely different parts it's using the bones around your ear rather than um, you could see that as outsourcing hearing or I'm outsourcing sight in that I just have somebody else go look for me and they tell me the information. 
that those would both be different different types of outsourcing, neither of which I mean, it seems that it's actually just not using that initial sense at all. Right. If I'm a blind person, I just have you tell me what color it is. Yeah. All right. So But a different a different analogy might be uh if we only had one kind of food and it had to be cooked. And so we have the oven as the you got your food source, it has to go in the oven, and then you eat. Well, would you say in that case that the oven is the cause of eating, right? If light is the way that things seen actually get to our eyes, then you could, it, I think it's, that's a very parallel case. And would you say that, you know what? I think eating is the most oven-like of the, of the human capacities that we have. Like, well, s s s I guess, but like, that's not a very, it's oven is not an adjective in that way. So, so the oven is the cause of eating itself. All right. Sun is not sight, sight, but it is the cause of sight itself. I mean, we right. seem to be set up for an analogy in which the beautiful, for instance, or the good are the cause of beauty and good in themselves. I mean, that even is if, different. Even if because... they. Yeah, go ahead. Because it's not it's our capacity to to take in beauty, right? If you're talking. Right. We, we were saying, what does others refer to? Does others refer just to sensory organs? That's what we've been talking about. So if we want to be very literal here, then it would have to be that um, there is the, the forms, the beautiful, the good, whatever. And then we need something in order to understand them, in order to make them intelligible. So let's say the intelligibility is a sense, just like sight and sound. Uh, you know, understanding is the name of uh, the human faculty. And yes, we're going to need some something in order to get the intelligible things connected to us. Is that? Yeah, I don't think that's so it's one thing to say that, right, the sun, we need the sun to see. We started out with light as a medium, and then we say the sun in a way is a medium. But now we're no longer saying the sun is a medium you know, or, or the cause of the medium of seeing, we are saying it's the cause of sight itself, which if we take that straightforwardly, if anyone said that today, we would think that's crazy. And it's on the verge of something mythological as if the sun God, you know, bequeathed us with this capacity. It's obviously, you know, it's a clear erroneous step in the argument and, and it's of a kind that happens frequently in the dialogue where it's, it's something almost like personification where uh he he loves this move he knows it's wrong he and he loves it and he thinks it's informative for some reason um this happy happens in the symposium as well that where certain arguments are predicated on the personification of love or the reification of love if you want to call it that would that don't really follow but i don't have a better explanation for that intuition right now but i i i think well Hopefully we'll read enough of this where we see where this is going and why why this is happening. Shall I get right. shall I continue? Sure. Let's say then that this is what I call the offspring of the good, which the good begot as its analog. What the good itself is in the intelligible realm in relation to understanding and intelligible things, the sun is in the visible realm in relation to the sight and visible things. Okay. So, so the I sun the sun helps us see visible things and it also is the cause of sight itself. The good um provides us a, with a medium in which we can have an experience of particulars as good, but it is also the cause of the good itself, I would say, on if we're going to take this analogy seriously. Um not the good itself, but of what? Of the capacity to experience good itself what is the what is the analog to sight here uh understanding intelligibility understanding yeah right intelligibility yeah the, the setup so the that faculty I, I of in some yeah the faculty of understanding if we wanted to put it in kantian terms is caused by the good go ahead the setup that i could have had us read a, a paragraph before here is this whole dialogue has been, you know, what is justice define 
So it's ultimately what is what is the good? And Glaucon demands, well, you haven't actually told us what the good is. And he's, well, I, I don't actually have direct access to that, but I can tell you about the offspring of the good. Mm -hmm. And that's what introduces this whole thing. So, yes, let's say then that what I call the offspring of the good, which the good begot as its analog. So this is the best that, that we can. I can't actually show you the good. It's, it's going to be something like showing you God itself, but I can show you the way that the good shows up in our experience, in our concepts. Mm -hmm. How? Explain a bit more. You know that when we turn our eyes to things whose colors are no longer illuminated by light of day, but by night lights, the eyes are dimmed and seem nearly blind, as if clear vision were no longer in them. Of course. Yet when everyone turns them on things illuminated by the sun, they see clearly and vision appears in those very same eyes. Indeed. Well, understand the soul in the same way. When it focuses on something illuminated by truth, and what is, it understands, knows, and apparently possesses understanding. But when it focuses on what is mixed with obscurity, on what comes to be and passes away, it opines and is dimmed, changes its opinions this way and that, and seems bereft of understanding. Yeah, so let's stop there. So the well, first you got to agree. You got to agree with truth. me first. <laughs> and what is, it understands. So only something that is illuminated by truth actually is. What is mixed with obscurity, what comes to be and passes away. So these are two two different things that it seems. So we got being be and becoming. Right. What will An come analogy to, to away, light and darkness. And what is are both metaphysical things. Illuminated by truth versus mixed with obscurity are epistemological things. So it's unclear whether he's saying those are one and the same thing. If something is, then mm -hmm. it will be illuminated by truth. If it is uh, changing, then necessarily it will be mixed with obscurity or now, what do you, what do you think about the relationship between those the metaphors? Well, I think yeah, this is right. Yeah, very tight relationship here between our epistemology and our ontology because the epistemological claim, epistemological claim, is that if we want to know something, it has to be being. Mm -hmm. What is becoming? Um, what is becoming is not noble. And becoming here, right, has the con. I think it's gignisthai, the word as in genus, and you know. So what grows? There's the there's the connotation of not just, um, or in other words, when we understand the broader world of becoming, I think it's helpful to think of the analogy of 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 growth, but um, of the fact that things change, right? So you know, we start out as a baby, become an adult and somehow we are the same there's some identity underlying this this change but um yeah so i'm just trying to now, now i'm just trying to think about this analogy between uh seeing things in the light seeing things in the dark and seeing it being focused on being versus being focused on becoming is this analogy exact it seems a bit different well the the epistemic because light because there's the medium the yeah it's not the epistem it's not the metaphysical parts because we haven't say it said that metaphysically things in light and things are dark in darkness are any different it's purely a matter of i mean the only difference metaphysically is the presence of light yeah focuses on something illuminated by truth yeah, so I'm kind of reading. Well, am I am I reading? I don't think so because he has mentioned being. What is it should be what I'm calling being. Mm -hmm. Yep. What comes to be and passes away is what I'm calling becoming. Mixed with obscurity, what comes to be and passes away. It's a bit different than saying when we see things by light or in the dark that you know, they're clear or obscure based on the presence or absence of light. Here, it's the presence or absence of 
it's, it's not even presence or absence. It's the admixture. Um, well, and, and it's, it's more the, about the, the thing itself, right? It's the nature of the object of, of our cognitive faculties. Whereas this talk of illumination by the sun, it's not a matter of the nature of what we're looking at, but whether light is present or not as a medium again. So do you see what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm trying to line up the analogy, but he's shifting here from the presence of the medium to the nature of the object of our cognitive faculties. So interestingly, when we, every time we actually can identify that we can understand something that we see, we're, we're falsifying the perception or rather we're diverging from the perception because the perception itself can only just show us masses of shapes and things and what we're actually perceiving be, because what we're actually perceiving are is a sensory world that is constantly changing. And so as soon as I see something and I say bunny, then I'm actually pulling in bunny. It's actually more true um, to the thing itself, right? If I'm actually identifying mm -hmm. it as a bunny, then I have identified the form of bunniness as being present in this shifting perception. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's not really- No, Mark, you socially constructed the bunny. <laughs> Sorry. I, I mean, it may well- it, no, you didn't. Strangely you enough, didn't. this is it's it's a matter of just <laughs> where the concepts construct the bunny. where the concepts come from. But I, yeah, I think that it it is the fact that for well, what do you think of this? That for Plato, for Socrates, are there really? I guess he has to he has to be a realist about yes, this actually really is a bunny, right? Yeah, and but, I think we ought to say that as well. There's all we have to be committed to there is not that the bunny be exactly, you know, bunniness be exactly as it seems to us in the empirical world, but that this particular entity is is a um, actually a tightly organized structure that is mind independent, whose structure and reality is independent of our minds. I'm thinking now of G more we actually cannot make the sense make sense of the world except in terms of the attribution of that mind independent quality to the to the thing i just i'm trying to think how well that actually works with plato that is there an existence that is mind independent or is all being by necessity intelligible being in other words it has mind attached to it that he actually is a Barclayan idealist. And insofar as something is unperceived, insofar it is merely out there, uh, then it actually does not, you know, it, it does not have light, the light of illumination of understanding on it. So it in fact is just an indistinct mass. So idealists are positing a mind independent reality. And they also preserve the distinction between my ideas, your ideas, and then the uh, idea in the general sense that belongs to the mind independent reality. So for Barclay, it's just God, right? God right. undergirds the mind independent reality. We, you and I perceive the same thing when we're in a room together, um, because God is coordinating the ideas between our minds and basically serves the function of a of a mind independent reality so to this say sounds just to, like plato to me whether whether your ontology is materialist or idealist or anything other uh, any anything else um there's no there's no rejection of a mind independent reality and then the, you know if we ask whether I, I think most most scholars would obviously say well I, there's a distinction between platonic idealism and Barclayan idealism, but I think you're on to something in the sense that um, does it really matter whether we're describing a system in which God inserts stuff into your mind or in which we are um, have this intelligible, immediate intellectual relationship to otherworldly forms? I'm not sure that it makes a difference overall what what i think is interesting you know if we wanted to contrast this to the aristotelian account where we might want to be more 
like empirical scientist about this and say there are actually these imminent forms of these tightly structured entities outside of outside of us and organic entities are our best examples of that mind independent structure and function well um plato seems to be saying actually we don't really find it in the world of coming becoming so we don't really find it in the particulars we have to shift our gaze upwards to these other entities in order to find that mind independent reality otherwise he seems sympathetic to the protagorean account or the heraclitian account when we're in the realm of um we're in when, insofar as we're in the cave or in this earthly realm of becoming um and focused on objects of the senses we're out of touch with being and truth and all the rest and mind independence even so i understand from a uh, a layman's point of view you know why why the, the term mind independent reality is uh, one that you like to use because it refutes the idea of idealism as uh, solipsism as as it is either either i am perceiving it or it doesn't exist like that is not anything that any idealist of any sort has ever believed uh, nor has it even been the case you know solipsism means only you that well if I perceive it or you don't perceive it or, you know, some human being still, this, mm. this is not what idealism is. But I think that saying that, oh, well, everybody, including Plato, believes in a mind independent reality is just not using the word mind in a way that Plato would be comfortable with. So if you if you want to say a noose independent reality or a logos independent reality, there is no such thing for Plato. So the 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 ambiguity here is about mind in general or a particular mind. I think right. this is where people get tripped up. I don't think any, I don't think even Plato would be uncomfortable with saying there's a mind independent reality in the sense of it being independent of my particular mind or your particular mind. It's just not independent of mindedness in general or exactly formality, if that's what you want to call it. So yes, our mind independent reality, and the same thing goes for Hegel, by the way, and, and none of this solves like the mind body problem or the problem of consciousness's relationship to a material world because it just gets rearticulated at the level of a relationship between particular minds and the greater mind if that's what you want to call our mind independent reality so the mind independent reality the, the reality is independent of my particular mind maybe a big mind like god's mind is for barclay maybe it is for hegel um maybe you could even say that for plato to, to some extent um uh, but, but yeah, it's, um, forget where I was going with that. Well, well, yeah. so what makes this Plato and Barclay different is that Barclay's idealism is supposed to still give full reign to science or Kantian idealism. All these post scientific revolution idealisms are supposed to say, yes, you can do an anatomy, a DNA analysis, whatever of the bunny, and that will all be. It doesn't matter what your sentiments about it are, you know, that's a, that can be objective fact and science can, can go forward. Whereas when you say, uh, well, everything, there is no reality that is independent of noose of, of general mindedness, but the light that is the noose, the mindedness, it, it, uh, it's, it doesn't, a lot of the, the world that we actually experience is very gloomy. In this respect it does not have a lot of noose in it so is there actually something that science can uh profitably study if everything is just going to be sliding out from under it and there's really nothing that can be understood because there's no mindedness there then actually it seems not yeah this i mean i the, this seems to be the case and i think it's the classic the, the standard interpretation of plato which is that he is despairing of doing science he is despairing of finding intelligibility within the realm of becoming and giving a system and systematic account of the realm of becoming if we want to give a systematic account and talk about what's true we really do have to stick with the forms that's that seems to be the suggestion and then of course aristotle will come along and give a very 
informative counter to that idea, right? Actually, we can maintain this idea of forms, but if we make them imminent, we can see how we can do science, at least Aristotle's version of science. And then, of course, with modern science, things will still will change. Right. And on, on our, our interpretation of Heraclitus in our Heraclitus episode with uh, Ava Bran, that she was positing that, you know, this person who described everything is constantly shifting is, well, there's a logos that organizes it. So it actually, there is an intelligibility to the constant changes such that even if the world is constantly changing and slipping out from under us, we don't have to falsify that and say, well, that's all just the skin on the top of the milk and the real stuff is underneath it. And that's what science should be getting to to the forms no we can actually describe the skin in intelligible ways we can we can give mathematical uh <laughs> make predictions with mathematical formulae which is you know that's what science is doing so even complex systems yeah so on the one hand you know it's worth reminding ourselves and we pointed this out in the cradleless episode that aristotle accuses plato of being pretty enamored of heraclitianism right at the level of becoming he seems it's almost like humean skepticism on analogy where kant kind of takes that very seriously and erects this whole theoretical philosophy which is meant to this critical philosophy which in some sense is meant to save the appearances from the power of the skeptical argument and it's very similar in plato where he's got a very hardcore metaphysics going on just because he takes the heraclitian challenge so seriously just because he's so pessimistic about our access to the world of becoming should we going. should we keep yeah. going uh, i'll be socrates so that which gives truth to the things known and the power to know to the knower is the form of the good and though it is the cause of knowledge and truth hold on is sorry where where are you? Is this? I thought this is where we. Stopped. I just. I must have. I must have been poking uh, around. You had and... said earlier. Understand the soul the same way. When it focuses on something illuminated. Just give me the truth, line. The line number. It's uh five oh eight, just before e. Okay. Yep. Got it. So that which gives truth to things known and the power to know to the knower is the form of the good, and though it is the cause of knowledge and truth, it is also an object of knowledge. Both knowledge and truth are beautiful things, but the good is other and more beautiful than they. In the visible realm, light and sight are rightly considered sun-like, but it is wrong to, to think they are the sun. So here it is right to think of knowledge and truth as good-like, but wrong to think that either of them is the good, for the good is yet more prized. All right, there's a lot. <laughs> that is super confusing, right? I mean, it, it lines up for me based on what's been said so far. Uh, what gives truth to the things known and the power to know, you know, is the form of the good. You know, I don't, I don't even know if we discussed. Well, what, why is it the good that is the basis of intelligibility? Why isn't it just the intelligible or something like that? We can think of accounts, right? We could, you know, both you and I can. Think of accounts perhaps in terms of teleology or something else which would make sense of this but what is what does plato mean yeah i would have to reconstruct something given what i understand about his ethics and things as to why why should the good have an epistemic role at all i think this is similar to the question you were asking of why is light valuable mm -hmm. in the site relation well because the whole premise of the, the thing is that the system is good. Good is the goal to which everything is always headed. That's just how movement works, right? At least for, uh, I want to say at least for minded conscious beings, right? It's, you know, that we could still have a principle of entropy or something in nature more widely. But insofar as it has noose in it, 
then it is defined as something. Well, what do you think of this? Is defined as something that heads toward the good, that it has a telos, an end built into it. Yeah, this all sounds very plausible, but I, I you know, I'm just kind of despairing <laughs> of the fact that how have I studied Plato for so long and I'm this weak on the role of the good in his system. I feel like it's a big blind spot. Maybe we can find a way to fill that gap at some point with PEL. I mean, vaguely, you know, I have this vague, vague sense of what's going on, but now, now that I think about it carefully, it's not entirely clear to me why we're just supposed to immediately accept this idea that the good is the basis of intelligibility and understanding. Right. So, why is, okay. why so is it's the, the good the cause of knowledge and truth mm -hmm. yeah. and also an object of knowledge? In fact, it seems like insofar as it is the cause of goodness and truth, it is not the object of knowledge, right? It is that is a transcendental thing that's happening somehow behind the scenes. We, we do not actually get to look at the sun, the sun in, or rather, yes, I can look up at the sun. I can draw a picture of the sun, but insofar as I'm using the sun as an object of knowledge, I am not understanding how the sun is illuminating the things on earth in front of me and making them available to my sight. I can't actually see the rays of light. Let me give another analogy for Kant. The apperception or some transcendental activity which produces representations, the representation I think, and synthesizes things from one moment to moment is the basis of personal identity of our, of our being mm -hmm. a self. But for Kant, we can't know that, you know, we couldn't, can't know self as substance, right? We can't know whatever it is that's doing that process. We can't look at that process itself as if it were some sort of entity. And then the German idealists come along. I mean, the other, you know, um, Schelling and, and Fichte and, and maybe to some extent Hegel say, well, actually, no. The self is an object of metaphysical knowledge. We actually can look at it. And in fact, the way Schelling puts it is that that whole process of producing a self-representation, of producing a personal identity involves our, in, our intuition of the process, right? In, in other words, the process can't do what it's supposed to do unless we are intuiting it doing what it's supposed to do anyway anyway that's a bit abstract but i uh, that's an important analogy of course that shows up later but yeah you know your point very well taken it's it's odd to say that the 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 thing that facilitates um knowing and having access to truth is itself something that can be an object of of knowledge the thing that that yeah right and but, how are all the forms somehow sub, sub subservient subsumed under the form of the good i feel like that is a great mystery that he might just say like a, a christian mystic well that's where it starts to be beyond our understanding that it's like the the form of the good is god well how do all the you know but plato is supposed to be such that all that stuff should be at least in the abstract, very clearly understandable, right? Is the most intelligible thing that there is. So you can't say, no, 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 we can, we can intellectually talk about abstractions, uh, you know, science, we could abstract talk about the, the creation or something, but we can't actually talk about God or the form of the good itself, because that is beyond human understanding. You could say it's the most clear thing, yet it's beyond human understanding would be wacko. Well, I know I promised never to do any homework for this podcast, but this does make me want to look, refresh myself on the good, <laughs> maybe look at Stanford. And when we come back to this next time, we'll, I, uh, you know, maybe have more to, more to say about that. Just looking some right. more at this yeah. same quote, uh, both knowledge and truth are beautiful things, but the good is other and more beautiful than they. So the beautiful was set up here just as an example of beautiful things versus the beautiful. Now we're saying that the beautiful and 
the true and you know that these are connected it's not actually that the beautiful things refer to things in the senses right that would be the thing that plato would dismiss as being shallow oh oh that beautiful person that beautiful person that beautiful lake no, 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 you got to get at the abstract. What is beauty? But when you're saying truth and knowledge are beautiful, then you're attributing this supposedly sensory thing of an abstraction. So, how, you know, this seems to raise a, a question about what beauty means exactly. It's not about symmetry. I mean, is truth symmetrical in the way that a beautiful face is symmetrical or something like that? It would seem very strange. Yeah, we know we're moving towards an account in which the, what is it? The particulars in the realm of becoming are like shadows of painted images of the forms, something like that. Two levels of mediation. I can't remember. Well, that's what's, let's, let's try to get to it. But <laughs> yeah, one day we will. But yeah, it's, uh, but yeah, this this relationship between particulars and forms is obviously very fraught and how it is that we are seeing a thing as beautiful by virtue of the form of beauty and all that is very confusing. But all right, shall we keep going? All right, sure. I'll, I'll be Glaucon now, who has a long line. This is an inconceivably beautiful thing you're talking about if it provides both knowledge and truth and is superior to them in beauty. In other words, the form of the good. You surely don't think a thing like that that could be pleasure. What it, the fuck are you talking about, Glaucon? When does my measure mention pleasure? No. All right, hush. Let's examine its image in more detail as follows. How? You'll be willing to say, I think, that the sun not only provides visible things with the power to be seen, but also with coming to be, growth, and nourishment, although it is not itself coming to be. How could it be? Therefore, sorry, is that right? Is that a correct transition? Yeah. In other words, it. Oh, okay. He's saying the sun is not right. come to be, and I'm saying, yep. How could the sun be coming to be? And you're not answering that. It's just a rhetorical question. Okay. Therefore, you should also say that not only do the objects of knowledge owe their being known to the good. But their being is also due to it, although the good is not being, but superior to it in rank and power. So the good gives objects their being. It gives them their intelligibility, their being known. Uh, and yet the good is not itself being. It is superior to being in rank and power. This is one of those negative theology things. You know, it's not that if, if, the, if the sun is what provides being, illuminatedness to everything i mean you'd still say the sun is the most illuminated thing right the sun illuminates itself but yet the the form of the good that gives being to everything else you think then it should have the most being like that is a a christian god like interpretation uh where god ha is the thing with the most being but no no actually the form of the good is superior to being yeah, so we would expect the form of being to be at the very top of our hierarchy. And it's not that that wouldn't be a little bit weird itself, because the forms are beings. And, right, so being is a form that has being, and its being is supposed to explain the being of everything else, mm -hmm. or, or at least that's what you might expect out of this ontology. Except that no. <laughs> There's something above it, the good, which of course is a form that has to have being, which would make you immediately think it's got to be inferior to being, but in fact, it's above it. Very counterintuitive. What does it mean? Why? Well, after Socrates has said that good is, is not being, but superior to it in rank and power, Glaucon comically said, by Apollo, what a demonic superiority. <laughs> it's your own fault. You forced me to tell you my opinion about it. And I don't want you to stop either. So continue to explain its similarity to the sun if you've omitted anything. 
I am certainly emitting a lot. Well, don't. Not even the smallest thing. There's something perverse about this. <laughs> I, I think I'll have to admit, omit a fair bit. But as far as is possible at the moment, I won't admit anything voluntarily. Don't. Understand, then, that as we said, there are these two things, one sovereign of the intelligible kind in place, the other of the visible. I don't say of heaven, so as not to seem to you to be playing the sophist with the name. In any case, you have two kinds of things, visible and intelligible. Right. It is like a line divided into two unequal sections. Then divide each section, namely that of the visible and that of the intelligible, in the same ratio as the line. In terms, of, in terms now of relative clarity and opacity, one sub subsection of the visible consists of images. And by images, I mean first shadows, then reflections in water and in all close-packed, smooth and shiny materials, and every, everything else of that sort, if you understand. Sure. So the thing at the bottom of the hierarchy, at the far side of the line, the far left, let's say, or the bottom, if you well, make it a vertical line. So that the very bottom is going to be not the objects in the world, but actual images of the objects, reflections in the water, et cetera, mirages. Um, well, he's putting, okay, so I, sounds like I got this wrong because shadows and images seem to be on the same level. Um, although maybe I was just thinking of the cave metaphor, but, um, all right. And this is a division images here. Not, this not is a division of the images. visible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is a division of the visible into, um, well, we've gotten one part of it. All right. In the other subsection of the visible, put the originals of these images, namely the animals around us, all the plants and the whole class of manufactured things. So this is still in the, the Consider visible. Consider them put. Really? Okay. Would you be willing to say <laughs> that as regards truth and untruth, the division is in this proportion? As the opinable is to the knowledgeable, so the likeness... To the knowable. Is to, oh, as the opinable is to the knowable, so the likeness is to the thing that it is like. Certainly. All right. We, Let's we just stop there. That. So... Let's just, yeah, try to, I think we, after that, we, we, we can okay, only we have got like two more minutes. So yeah, let's think about that. But we can know the things. I mean, yeah. that, that's actually not going to be the case because these are, these are both parts of the visible world. And so it'll turn out that we only have opinions of the whole thing, but he wants to say in general, you know, where you're doing your analogies test on the, the SAT or whatever. As the opinable is to the knowledgeable, the like to the thing is, the likeness is to the blank. What's to the, the thing it's a likeness of? Yeah. So we, you know, once again, we get an epistemological and an ontological component to this. We get images and becomings, right? I'm not even sure, should, should we be calling them beings, images and becomings? Mm hmm. Yep. And, and corresponding to that on the level of our cognitive access, let's put it that way, are our what? One of the one's belief and one's imagination. Uh well, uh, I mean, I don't know if that imagination doesn't make sense. is the same as opinion. So opinion I mean it's it's strange to say Well belief is opinion, pistis. Okay. So and that belongs to our access to Becoming to, to these, okay, the divided section, the visible, right? Okay, so the visible is the object of belief slash opinion. And the images are, maybe he hasn't really said yet what they're the object of. It is just strange to say that a likeness, the relation of a likeness to the thing is one of representation or resemblance. The likeness represents or resembles the thing. Uh, does the opinion therefore resemble or represent the knowable i don't think so i think it is just that the knowable because an, an example of the kind that this is not talking about the difference between the image of the rabbit and the actual rabbit but between actual rabbits in the world we can only have opinions about i might be wrong that might not even be a rabbit 
But once I start, once I abstract from that to the concept of rabbit hood, I can say all sorts of things that, oh yeah, rabbits by definition are whatever that thing is that's an animal that has ears like that or whatever. Uh, so those are things that we can actually have, we can have knowledge about the concept of rabbit hood of what that means. We just can't have actual knowledge. We can only have opinion about the real rabbits that we see in the world because we could just be wrong. Yeah. So I think the important thing to to keep in mind as we go forward is that we, you know, we have this broader division between the visible visibility and intelligibility between mm -hmm. the empirically knowable, maybe quote unquote, and what can be known rationally, intellectually, however you want to put it. And then that division recapitulates itself within the realm of the visible so that we get these opinable things that can be subject to opinion and belief, which are analogous to what is knowable and in, in the sense of noesis, rational, um, rational comprehension, or maybe intellectual intuition, you call it, you could call it. They're analogous. And, and if we are good empirical scientists today, that's what we do think is the realm of the knowable, right? These visible things insofar as we can give a systematic account of them in terms of propositions, um, beliefs, opinions. So, uh, but they will turn out to be quasi, I, I don't know how he's going to put it. I can't remember, but, um, this empirical realm of things, which we would normally ordinarily think of as knowable, um, it it corresponds to the knowable, but it's not quite the knowable. Right. I'm trying to I'm trying to take my uh, analogy even more literally. In that, is there if you if you accept that what I just said about concept of rabbit hood versus individual rabbits is accurate to what Plato thinks? Is there something comparable about individual rabbits versus the reflections of individual rabbits in the water that in other words i could have a certain level of uh, of surety you know I've, I've collected all the rabbits i i keep them in a hutch i can study them all day and night i can make, <laughs> say many things about you wear their skins at you <laughs> about them individually <laughs> you're friends but, with them you eat them for dinner that they're, they're you're, but i have a mirrors whole... all around the rabbit hutch and can i say <laughs> about the reflections in the mirrors can i also know something about those reflections it seems like i could know there's not as much to know you know the reflection doesn't have a temperature for, you know any any different than the rest of the mirror but it uh it seems like i could measure the reflections and say something about like well if the bunny hops two feet further away from the mirror here's how big the reflection is it seems like it's i could still make law-like statements about the reflections they would just be less useful than the, the yeah, that I mean, ultimately, it seems like we are talking about imagination and we are talking about representation, right? So what is it we can say about our representations of empirical objects systematically? It reminds me of when, you know, we, we saw a lot of that with Locke, where in a way, he wanted to describe the structure of our ideas and the relations between ideas and all the rest of it, that that was his substitute for ontology. Um, but in any case, I can't I can't remember enough of that just to pull it to pull it all out right now. But the but do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's one thing to talk about mirrors and reflections and images, but ultimately, I think he's going to want to talk about representation. But maybe right. maybe I, I'm getting that wrong and. And belief and pistis and opinion go with representation. I can't. Um, I'd have to think about this. Well, more, and I'm not but, sure yeah. what what Plato thinks specifically about imagination, because we haven't seen that word in here. And clearly, you know, that would be part of the process of making a shifting, changing thing into something that's understandable would involve imagination, because it is, like I said. If I perceive this thing that's just jumping around as rabbit, then I am I'm freezing it and I'm using my imagination to do that. Imagine if that momentary thing actually corresponds. So it seems like imagination is a way 
of getting to the forms, but that's probably not what you mean. And that's certainly not what like artists use their imagination to come up with representations of things. And these representations are going to be definitely worse than the things they're going to be crummy copies. So in that sense, he's down on imagination. So I'm just not sure. Whereas like Locke and Kant have a definite role for this word imagination. I, I don't know what, what role we would want to assign in Plato. Mm -hmm. All right. I think Let's it's a good wrap place up to here. Next time we will hear more about uh, the, the, how the section of the intelligible is to be divided and we'll get to the end of book six here, the beginning of book seven. I thought we were going to finish book six this session. The beginning of book seven is the, the allegory of the cave. So we'll have at least one more session to get the end of here. If we want to keep going and do the actual allegory of the cave, that would be, I, I we will number three. I mean, I, I'm willing to go on this for as long as you want, weeks and weeks and weeks. I would love to just keep <laughs> reading this. All right. Well, this, this is really fun. the perfect, this is actually the perfect type of thing for this for this show i mean but we can talk about that all right most certainly bye everybody you're damn right socrates all right bye <laughs>